In this episode, you're going to learn what's it like to be in the middle of a transition into service design. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Herb, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 140. Hi, I'm Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to understand what's beneath the surface of service design, what are the hidden things that make the difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people and business. Our guest in this episode is Herb Scheuer who reached out to me with an interesting idea and that was to use him as a guinea pig. Now, let me explain. The guests you hear on the show have often already a quite established understanding of service design. Most of them say something like that they've been doing service design for years before they knew it had an official title. Now, Herb is actually in the midst of this transition from an adjacent field into service design. And what I enjoyed about this conversation is that he brings a fresh outside perspective while not being in our bubble yet. Because once you're in that bubble, it's really hard to take a beginner's mind. So I encourage you to listen to this conversation and think about which questions aren't you asking enough? And what are the things you're taking for granted in your work that are actually really important? Before we dive into the conversation, I really want to thank Herb for having the courage to jump into this conversation with me and share the experience he's going through, knowing very well that other professionals who are maybe more experienced are listening right now. If you are a service designer professional who wants to level up their game, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon to be notified when new videos are out. So now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Herb Scheuer. Welcome to the show, Herb. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, awesome to have this conversation with you. It's going to be a unique episode. That's a thing I know for sure, even though we haven't recorded it yet. Um, this is going to be an experiment, uh, which I love doing things that are uh, a bit different than uh, I've done before. Uh, but uh, before we give too much away, uh, let's start with uh, a short introduction for the people who don't know who you are and haven't looked you up on LinkedIn yet. Could you uh, share something about what you do today? Uh, so today I am a principal design strategist uh, and that is a new role for me. Um, my background has been either to be a strategist or uh, an account planner at various types of advertising and marketing agencies. So I'm moving into a new role, uh, a little bit more, or I shouldn't say a little bit, but definitely into the design and service design world and excited to see where this new adventure takes me. All right. And that's uh, going to be, to be a red threat throughout this episode, which we'll explore in a second. But before we do that, uh, we go through our classic uh, by now rapid fire question <laughs> round. Five questions. Yeah, your task is to answer them as quickly as possible. Sure. Uh, ready? Yeah. All right. What's always in your fridge, Herb? Uh, I always have goat milk. I've goat? gotten obsessed with goat milk in the last couple of years, and it's just uh, I, I have to have it for all my cereals and chocolate chip cookies. Mm, interesting. Goat milk. Haven't had that one on the show before, but hey, uh, <laughs> maybe I'll try it as well. Uh, which books books are you reading, uh, if any, at this moment? Uh, I am refreshing myself on jobs to be done. Uh, it's a book I read several years ago. And to get myself into the new role, I was like, oh, there's a few books I just need to get page back through. So that is the current one. Uh, I just started it three days ago. So I'm kind of like into the meat of it right now. And it's just, it was a refresher. I read it several years ago, but it was, that's where my head's at now. So mm, all, to be done. all business yeah. books, nothing fun. Uh, well, th 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 those can be fun as well. Um, <laughs> what was your first job? Uh, my first job, so I grew up on a farm. I'm a farm kid in Iowa. So my first job was, of course, uh, bailing hay for the neighbors. Uh, my first job in marketing was I was the taco man for Taco Bell at the halftime show for the Chicago Bulls. How, so I how got, about that? <laughs> yeah, I got my I got my in for 
uh, actual <laughs> being a mascot. And then from there, I got internships in different agencies and kind of set my career off. Awesome. That's that's <laughs> good. Uh, I'll look up your LinkedIn profile if it's still on there. Um, uh, and now maybe the question uh, that we're also going to explore throughout the episode, but yeah. when did you learn about service design? Your first encounter? Uh, yeah, so my first encounter with service design was literally when I interviewed into the position I'm in now. Uh, I hadn't heard of that name. I haven't heard of that that calling a a, a, a area in kind of this field until I encountered it there. Uh, once I encountered it, you know, then spent some time familiarizing myself, looking it up, you know, learning about it very quickly, um, was very intrigued by it. But that was the that was the first time I'd actually had heard of of those words put together like that. Mm. And that's fascinating because usually I have guests here on the show who sort of are familiar with service design for years, decades, and you're just transitioning into it. And often um, people sort of look back on their service design experience and say, yeah, at some point I stumbled into it and I realized that there is something like service design, but I've been doing it for years. Um, but that's usually years, uh, years later. Now we are at an intersection where you reach out uh, to me and said, um, I'm just stumbling into this service design thing. I'm going to uh, be exploring what it is. Uh, so why not have a conversation right now, rather than in a few years about my expectations uh, about what service design might be. And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. I don't think we've covered that on the show uh, before. So um, here we are. Um, so Herb, you mentioned one of the things uh, uh, in our prep call was that you feel like uh, it's all, you're, you're going to be one of them. I think you phrased it like, uh, like that. Uh, how would you describe them? Who, who are they? <laughs> Yeah, it's a really interesting kind of, I've been going through a very kind of interesting through thought process, a lot of feelings about where I'm going to, the group I'm in now and the people I'm around, I have so much respect and admiration for the work and how they think about the work because I, I've always kind of had the title of planner or strategist, you know, in some various way, shape or form, but I've never carried a title that had design in it. And I've always worked alongside design. I've always worked either partnered or like, you know, on projects or leading teams where, you know, where there was two of us, you know, welded to the hip of like, you, you know, you run UX group, you run a strategy group. Okay. We're going to tackle this problem for this client. So always was working with design but never had the design title. So that I've had both, I've had interesting mixed feelings of going in and understanding what it means to carry the design title. And the reason being is I feel over the years, I've not been a design practitioner. I've been someone who, you know, has worked with the practitioners of the field and understand that there is a craft, a way to do things. I mean, I make a good enough PowerPoint deck, but I do. I am not a visual designer by any means, and uh, you know, and not to pick on visual design is just like this idea of now wearing kind of the design title. At the same time, the group I'm working in, you know, there's there's service designers, product designers, there's all the different types of design. So I had a a, a first, you know, I don't want to say fear, but a first like nervousness of like oh my goodness, I'm going in to work with people who know the language of design, know what it means to carry the design title, and I don't. And mm. it wasn't imposter syndrome. It was more, well, I don't want to let these people down. I don't I don't want to be the one that is always uh, having to play catch up because um, I wanted to be able to be able to collaborate and work and just kind of, you know, be part of, everything that we do um but know that i just knew i didn't have or i never had that title and i didn't know if that mattered or not and i'm that's one of the reasons you know in my exploration of like learning about service design learning about all things designs came across your show and every you know and various other places and i was like oh this world this language i'm starting to learn it um and that's why i reached out because i was like oh i like this is to me an interesting 
you know, I always like to explore interesting spaces as well and thinking about like, oh, what does this mean to start wearing, you know, possibly a design title? And does that really change anything? Does that matter? I don't know. And so that's why I reached out to kind of explore and explore that space. Yeah, and uh, we don't have to come up with answers here. Let's uh, uh, questions are just as uh, valuable. And w what's interesting about the perspective you're bringing into this conversation, from uh, my perspective, is that you have an outside look on the design space, the service design space. Usually, uh, I have guests who are already sort of biased and influenced from within yeah. the bubble and you're sort of standing next to it or with one feet in uh, the space. So it's interesting to learn and hear how you, in this case, look at the service design space from uh, yeah from a different perspective. And I think that will be a lot of fun to uh, uncover. Maybe uh, you, so you mentioned um, uh, something briefly about uh, your background. Uh, could you give like uh, an herb, uh, bird's eye view of uh, your recent career and how you actually got into this position where uh, you're taking on a service design role? Yeah, uh, so I I make the joke, I sum up my career as I've seen a lot of different kind of strategy movies or marketing movies. And what I mean by that is I've been a planner or strategist in a lot of different agency or agency type roles. Um, everything from I, uh, a classic brand creative agency to a media performance agency to a PR agency to a giant PR agency to an official, what I would say, digital agency that was focused on a, you know front end solutions of mobile, digital, all the way over to you know even dis uh, it, it display in stores and things of that nature. So I, I, I've been in a role that is always kind of like taking different turns into thinking about strategy, thinking about connected to the consumer, thinking about learning about a target audience, pulling insights to drive some sort of output, you know, across the marketing spectrum. Uh, the last role before this role that I got into was working in uh, pharma. So I, I took that job because it was an interesting perspective of like, well, I've never worked as a strategist in a regulatory field you know, how is that different and working with very, very, very small target audiences? How do we impact that in kind of rare and ultra rare diseases, which I found fascinating. And I think my career has always been, hey, I love learning and getting into and being curious about different spaces of how to understand target audiences or groups of people and activate against them. And this role, you know, well, this role popped up the where I'm in now because I've been with people I'd worked with in the past, um, mentor of mine I'd worked with, you know, kind of an ongoing conversation. And it just happened to be a, a right time, right place and said, hey, have you ever thought about doing this? And his take on me was, you thought in this way in a lot of different versions of your career. He's like, I think you would make a nice fit here. I think you would bring a perspective of understanding how to tackle problems to drive solutions, you know, especially in kind of this design field, because you do have his, his words, not mine was, you know, you're always, you're half thinking about the business, business problem, you're half thinking about consumers and really wearing the consumer hat, this might be a nice really fit for you. And I think you'd find a nice home here. And that was interesting to me. It was interesting of, hey, I've, <laughs> I've seen, I, I like exploring all these spaces. I like seeing how these connect. And this just naturally fit to me as a, as a next evolution of like, oh, let's go, let's go try this on. Let's see how this fits. Let's, this seems really interesting to figure out how to take, um, you know, uh, not just think about consumers as, you know, one specific target audience that we're working with marketing, but starting to think about, well, how does this impact you know, when we get into like the idea of service design, and I may butcher this, the, the definition or what it means, because I'm still learning. So please help me along the way. But the, you know, the front of the back house and the back of the house, how those connect, how sometimes, you know, it's stakeholders, it's people inside the company, it's, you're actually learning from them, and then helping create new solutions that impact everything along the way. And I, my, my, maybe my secret sauce to this whole thing is 
you know, I've always had the idea of target and brand and rattling around in the back of my brain. So it's like, oh, well, then how, even if we design a new, you know, a new way for someone to walk through the store or uh, a new way for someone to buy something through the mobile app that, you know, changes a lot of the back end, back end processes. How is that still on brand or how does the brand or the company show up there that makes it unique to them? So the solution is still unique to them. So that's how I, I don't know if that quite answers your question or if I meandered too much there, but really kind of like it was taking a, the, I've seen a lot of different ways strategy, consumer and insights have come to be, come you know to drive uh, solutions. And this was a new opportunity to explore that space. Yeah, so basically it also comes down to the thing that you already had a service design mindset. Uh, you just had somebody pointed out to you that there is a thing called service design and there is a role called service. Yeah. I think so. I, you know, and, and I've heard, and I've seen a couple episodes from your show and like, I've heard that theme come up and I was like, every time I heard it, I was like, oh yeah, that's what probably, yeah. Like, you know, the people who have designed backgrounds, like, oh, they find this and it makes a lot of sense. And then the more I've been exposed to it and the more I've been around it and the, the more I've worked with people in my current role uh, and just learning from them and the uptake, I've been like, oh my goodness. Yeah. My, my head does work like this. Like, oh, this is true. Like what they say on the podcast is right. Like, yeah, like, oh, I, I do, like, this, this does make a lot of sense to me. And it's, 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 it's both fascinating and uh, drives my curiosity to explore it even more, because mm. I'm like, oh, maybe this is the right home for me. Let's go, let's go to the moment where I don't know how your um, application process went for this job, but I'm curious to, to learn, like, uh, where, what was the conversation? Because uh, going into uh, the job application, uh, how, how did you feel? How uh, yeah, take 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 us back to that moment. Um, my well, I cheated a little bit in that I knew several. I had worked with several of the people that I was talking to in the past, so like we had some familiarity. But where I was nervous, and I'll be honest, I'm still nervous even right now, is how does my background, how does my way of thinking, how does my way of like, you know, understand getting to solutions or like brainstorming and collaborating and all of this, how does that fit? And then what don't I know? I, I like I'm still learning, you know, the nomenclature, I'm still learning things. And, and I have joked with people, like when someone says something like, oh, that's high and low, high and uh, low fidelity prototyping. I'm like, oh, 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 I, oh, I've seen that before. Oh, I know what that is. Like, there's been so much language and things I've learned. I'm like, oh, I know what that is. But going into the process and going into it, I, I was very nervous around, hey, how I think and how I approach you know, being a strategist and a problem solver, does that actually fit here? Um, because it it wasn't like a foreign language, but it was a, a language with a very heavy dialect. And I'm like, am I really understanding people? Are people really understanding me? Does this really match up? And that's where my one of my large concerns is when I was going through the interview process was, hey, is this really a fit or is this just a yeah, it sounds like it does. Mm. So um, it, it helped that you knew some people and that they knew your background and uh, then it helps to uh, uh, sure. see if there is a fit. Now, um, what I, I'm having this career and having this background, um, this is an, a, a path that um, maybe isn't the most obvious one. Maybe it is, I don't know, but what what still motivates you to um, pursue this opportunity? Why do you think that this is uh, an interesting step uh, in your career right now? Because what the, the more I've gotten into this role and the team I've been around is the, I've landed on this idea of, oh, what I'm doing is, you know, the team I'm working with is we take like kind of, <laughs> We quoted this the other day because we were talking about this internally. It's like, oh, we take intangible solutions and make them, tan or we take intangible problems and make them tangible solutions. This idea of 
that, hey, we have to actually figure out the problem and make sure it's the right problem and then figure out ways to solve that. And that is something that I've always been drawn to and always motivated by. by. And I think, you know, my career has always been, has had a large part of that, no matter what I've been doing. I've had to go in and like, figure out like, oh, what's the right problem? What are the right problem we're really to solve? And like, how are we solving it within this box or within this frame? And now I think I'm just in a different place to do that with a lot of people who are actually doing the same thing. And we're all, we all, I think now have a, a collective understanding of, yeah, we are trying to identify the problem and find the solution. Now, do I think it's novel and only done in a service design group or, you know, that's not done across the field? No. Um, what I do notice the difference is, is I do think there is a, a broader aspect of what the solution could be. I think the, the, what I've learned is while sometimes we can apply the idea of design to make just the mobile app or just make a specific um, like where something sits in a store or how, a, you know, how the, how the uh, POS system works or something like that can be very, very particular. It can also be applied at a little bit broader scale to actually figure out, okay, what is the, what is the best way to create the experience for a consumer? And that may not sound as nuanced um, saying it out loud, but I'm finding that that is where the real nuance is. It is really thinking about, hey, the experience itself, there's a little bit of meta pulled in that helps create, find the right solution. And you have to kind of work at it and figure out, okay, what are the different pieces and different ways and understanding the your audience, your target audience persona, different, a little bit different to get there than I would have experienced maybe in just creating a, a brand campaign, mm -hmm. like, you know, something for TV, like how uh, a creative works there. And I think the you know, someone creating creative messaging is highly attuned in that way. And I think it's fascinating how their brain works. This is just a little bit different, I think, and just makes a little bit more sense to me because it's about the real experience of like the tangible things you're going to touch and do, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. I'm also very, <laughs> I'm also very nervous on this show right now because I feel like I'm getting into language or using language that I'm, I'm picking up at the same time. So uh, that's perfect. please correct me or no, send no, me no, like, that's, that's, no, I think I, you, what you mean here is something different here, but please, cause I am yeah. I'm learning as I'm going here. And I, I think that's the interesting part because um, uh, it's interesting to see this transitioning and um, to see which, uh, which words, which jargon sort of uh, get, yeah. gets on your path uh, soon, which things stick, which uh, things don't stick. And one of the things I heard you say what, uh, what excites you about this opportunity um, and the way I would translate it is that you're not tied to a specific medium or channel where you can design uh, the solution. Like the solution is channel agnostic, it's medium agnostic, yeah. it can be anything. Uh, and that opens up a lot of new opportunities to come up with solutions. That's what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely part of it. Um, even in projects that I've been exposed to in the last even two weeks, there. what's nice about what you said there, I think that is totally true. And like, hey, it's, it's open to interpretation of like where the solution shows up. But what I found fascinating is even in the smaller areas of a project where it seems more constrained, there's still that possibility there. There's still that possibility to turn it on its side and say, oh, wait a minute, it, this doesn't make sense. Like, it, 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 we shouldn't be using a pencil here. We actually need a big red marker. That would be a better, better mm -hmm. solution. And like, oh, that is interesting. And mm -hmm. that's interesting for me to try to figure out. So, um, I'm curious. You mentioned something about that you f that you think you still might have gaps in your skills yeah. in your knowledge. Let's uh, dive a little bit in that. You're basing this, I guess, on the work that you've seen other designers, service designers do. Maybe some literature. Maybe the service design show podcast. Who knows? Um, 
but what where do you feel the gaps might be most prevalent where, where do you want to level up the gaps is twofold one is now that i've been into it like there are artifacts uh, one i'll pick on is you know an idea of the service design blueprint you know and i think that is something that is becoming a little bit standard or the, that idea a service design, a blueprint is somewhat standard in different service design maybe approaches and craft um i've been exposed to that and seeing how that works and doesn't you know well not no. let me back that up seeing how that works with journeys and persona and how the personas and how that comes together that service that the idea of the blueprint wasn't a f as soon as i saw it i was very comfortable and like oh i see what it i see what it is and i see what it's doing and i see the pieces of how to get there but that was new to me that was something i i you know that was an artifact that was completely new that Once I saw it, I got it. And um, there's a couple of people I work with who've made some really nice ones that have been really helpful in understanding it. And so there's, I, I feel fortunate in that to be, that's one of them that is probably like a pure artifact where the other gaps, you know, the a little bit more kind of like intangible ones were what I still don't know. There's, there is some language, um, Like, this is dumb, but just like, I knew what a prototype was. I always had an idea, but I didn't always understand maybe how often they got applied, how low or lo-fi or hi-fi, how, you know, when, when they were put into like, or when they should be, like, when's the right idea to bring them in or like, when to go about it. Now, the answer is anytime, anywhere, like you can, you, like, there's no, there's no right or wrong to it. Right. But it was when you, like, when I started like reading some of the material and they're like, oh, you should prototype now. Like one of the questions I like, wrote down, I was like, oh, do you, do you always, do you prototype every time? Do you do that? Like, should you always be doing that? And the answer I'm learning is yes. And maybe like all at the same time. Now that's a weird one to pick on because <laughs> like, it's kind of generic and kind of like, oh, you should always prototype. But it was just one of those things of like things I ran into in my previous roles, we wouldn't have prototyped hardly ever. Like we would never really sketch. There might've been mock-ups of the, uh, or we might've mocked stuff up if we were doing user testing or if I was around like website development. Yeah, like that would probably get in some way, shape or form. But the idea of like really leaning into that impossible earlier testing or middle testing or late, like that was kind of like a new idea that I was like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't new, but that totally makes sense. Like we should be doing that all the time. And so there's been like little things along the way that I've just had to like, oh, okay, that's, yeah, that makes sense now that I've been exposed to it. And so those unknown, those unknown ones have been the ones that have, you know, weirdly kind of surprised me the most first, the bigger kind of artifacts once you kind of hear their names mm. if that makes sense yeah 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 yeah. and <clears throat> like the artifacts are I, i would say the the thing that's the easiest to learn yeah like there are books uh and the other thing with regards to prototyping that's that's mostly an attitude thing and the answer that you found or like when should you prototype you always and uh sometimes um the 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 challenging part I think about design and service design is there are many ways to do it right. And when you're joining in, sure. you're, you're sort of looking for, okay, like show me, show me how to do it. And when you, when you, um, uh, run into a stubborn service designer, they might say like, just do, do, do whatever you think is best. Like <laughs> there is no right, wrong. And, uh, in a sense that's true, but that's, that's not, It's it's not the easiest way to get into this field. I don't know if you've experienced something similar. Yeah, it's so. I'd say one of the you know the real. The, it's the difference between toolbox and and then box of process. <laughs> like, here's here's all the tools. Here's all the things. Here's a service design blueprint. But which is an easy thing to be like, oh, I can wrap my head around that. But it's like, all right, so what's the process to get there? And then how do we really use that in, you know, is this the 
is this the output or the outcome? And how does this help drive the outcome of what we were asked or tasked to do? And so it's been like figuring out how to put these pieces in place, like how, a, you know, how a project actually works, like from start to finish and wrapping around there. And I think that's one thing that, you know, weirdly it is defined and, you know, you can read about it in books and you can read about it in like blog posts and other things. People talk about it like, oh, here's how we start the process. We do some of this, we do some of this, then we do some of this. And it's weird because on paper, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yep. That makes sense. But until you start doing it, you don't really see how the, the artifacts and tools that you have actually get applied to actually drive and how you might, uh, you might not need to do that step. Uh, that can just be talked about. Uh, that can be whiteboarded, you know, and done with, and we can move forward, but actually you got to spend a lot of time digging in here. Um, and that, you know, that cadence and that understanding um, is, is probably something if you're tra- if you're coming, if you're new to this or haven't done this, especially from my outside point of view, that cadence and understanding is probably one of the, the tougher things to start wrapping your head around, but it's not hard. It's just until you see it or experience it, even on paper, it's just one of those things where you kind of look at it and go, well, yes, that makes sense. But until you're in the thick of it, do you really understand how to internalize it? Yeah. And there are so many micro decisions that go into uh, the process, which aren't documented, documented and are impossible to document. Uh, yeah. but, but that's the thing uh, you're running into. Like, uh, sure, you can describe a five-step process to anything in service design, but uh, then once you start doing the process, there are like a, a thousand questions you need to answer throughout and make judgment calls. And those judgment calls are things that you can only learn through practice, uh, are, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, totally. And w- as you're speaking there, I was like, well, what's the through line? What what keeps me sane? Like, I was trying to like, just kind of reflect on what you're saying. I was like, yeah, it's all those little decisions. And I always think, what I landed on was, oh, as long as you say curious in the moment, you can like figure out how to sort through some of this. And I think that's where I've had to lead into is like constantly, which is part of why I think I took this position role all up was, hey, the curiosity of like, keep asking the questions, keep like figuring it out. This like, this desire to like, well, let's figure this out. Let's put this together. Like, how does this come together? Because as you said, there are a lot of like little micro decisions along the way that you just have to, once you get there, you can figure out like, oh, this makes sense. But what's helped is, you know, what's helped me along the way is like, keep asking questions. Like there's no dumb question. There is, but there, like be comfortable with just like exploring why and like, mm-hmm. okay, why is this happening now? Because the uptake will, I, I think I've experienced it as will happen much quicker. And that's, that's already a great insight for anybody who's interested in transitioning into service design. Like you might get hung up on the fact that, um, that it's a craft and you need to know what you're doing and you, you know, but, but what you're what you're saying is that there is just a really simple process uh staying curious and figuring stuff along uh, out along the way it's like um <clears throat> one of the things i i like to compare design and service design to is like in, improv theater like you don't know what's <laughs> going to yeah. happen next but you, you you have a process and an approach and an attitude which you can apply in any situation to get to the next situation and i think in a lot of uh uh, the design processes, it's the same. You you sort of know high level what's going to happen. There's a start of the show and there's an end of the show. But in anything that happens uh, in between uh, happens a lot in the moment and you have to trust a very simple process in which you described as being curious and figuring stuff out, which I uh, yeah. same curious, prototyping things, trying things out. Uh, that makes a lot of sense already. Yeah, there's also a, I don't know how to quite describe this, uh, how people approach this. So, you know, I come from more of a strategy planning background versus uh, a design craft background. And what I, I might be using the wrong language here to describe that. So 
uh, forgive me, but the idea of, hey, if you're coming from a visual designer, if you're coming from more of a, a, a formal UX training, right? Like something into this space versus coming from, you know, strategy planning. We, we've, we come from like different processes to, or different ways of thinking to get to the same idea. And I had a great discussion with a couple of people that I work with who I would say come from more the craft side. And it's what I've noticed is I've had to figure out how to apply a little bit more process to my thinking to be able to help be on the team to work through a problem versus when I'm talking with someone who's coming from a bit more of a craft design craft background, there's already a, a, a rigor applied and how to loosen that up a little bit to think a bit more broadly. And where we're meeting in the middle, I think is a really interesting space. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I don't, it'll be interesting if, you know, you ping me a year from now, if I have better language to describe what I just walked through there, because I do think there is, that's kind of the, the interesting thing where we're mashing together and where I've seen like different people come at it because I, I work with a, someone um, that moved in, it's going through the same process I am in this team. And we talked about it and we we're feeling a similar thing where it's like, Oh, we can't, you know, we always approach, you know, strategy from, yeah, let's understand the consumer. And like, we didn't have a lot of like rigid ways we did it. We always kind of like duct taped it together. Um, And that's one, like this meeting of like where a rigid kind of way to do it versus a completely, you know, scatterbrained way to do it where that's coming together, I think is an interesting process, but, or an interesting space, but we are, we're figuring it out. And that to me is very, I don't know, interesting. <laughs> were there already, um, and I'm sure there there were, uh, some uh, major aha moments for you stepping into this new role? I'd say the first one is, um, the first aha is, oh, everyone's trying to figure it out. Like, Everyone is trying to put it together. There is this, everyone has this inherent sense of curiosity, inherent sense of um, how, how do we really make something? Um, but, you know, and what is, what is experience? And like another aha is really, oh, we talk like how to really formally talk about creating experience. And what does that mean? I don't have an answer for like that language or how to like create experience yet, but the aha behind it is, oh, everyone's, everyone is thinking this way, maybe just a little bit differently, but we are all thinking around this idea of like, oh, how do we, how do we create, how are we consciously creating that experience that's going to solve this problem? And that was one of the bigger, like, oh, every, oh, okay. Every, yeah, everybody's thinking this way. Okay. I just got to, Okay, it's okay. I'm okay. Like, yeah, I, I got. I can figure this out. So, what were you expecting, or if if that was an aha moment and you figured out everybody is thinking this way, what was your uh, Im- image of the situation before? I thought there was going to be, and I don't know why I thought this. Maybe it's just, well, I do know why. I can explain here in a second. But I thought there'd be a bit more formality or a bit more this is how we design. Like I thought there would be a bit more like capital D design and like how we do things. Um, And it's not that there is an informality. It's not that we, (laughs) there isn't a rigor or way to do things. I just thought there would be a, a larger, Oh, this is how we design. And I think I have this inherently in me as uh, earlier in my career, when I was around a lot more, I'd say visual design and a lot more very specific design, I would say the people I interacted with carried the, 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 the word design with a very, very capital D. It, it meant that you were, you, you know, you, you had a certain style about you, you had a certain craft about you, you had a certain presence and, you could always tell like, oh, this is a design team and I am not cool enough to be one of those cool kids. 
which, and I don't say that, <laughs> I don't want that to come off as negative. It's more of an observation that, oh yeah, there was definitely an inherent sense of taste and flavor, which drove their creativity, which I appreciated. And I always assumed that was, that's, that's what design was, you know, it's like, oh, the Steve Jobs and the black turtleneck, like, oh, you, you, you have to look this part, right? Like, that's what design is. And what I've learned over the last couple of years, and especially with, you know, the group I'm in now, no, there is, <laughs> there's small D design and it's kind of the same thing, but it's more of an approach of like, oh, we're trying to figure out how to solve this problem than it is like, than it is a, a, a creative craft in like flavor of like specific things. I have a lot of respect for people who are in the capital D design because, you know, of what they do and how they put things together. Cause I know I am not, but what I think my stigma coming into it was, Oh, everybody's that way. And so the and one, what I'm learning yeah. is <laughs> what I'm learning is like, no, no, there's a lot of like people like me just running around with a, you know, not the coolest t-shirt, but a cool enough t-shirt to be like, yeah, we can all do this too. <laughs> and that's, um, this sort of unfortunate that design has that, uh, image, uh, because I think it becomes less accessible and uh, less inviting for a lot of people who could potentially contribute uh, a whole deal to this field. Uh, so, uh, through this show, I also hope to evangelize a bit more that design is accessible, service design is more accessible and you don't have to have a formal degree and uh, it's okay when you're coming in from a different background. Now, um, that, that was an aha moment. Um, and I'm also curious to learn about what, what have you experienced as the most challenging thing so far? I think the most challenging thing for me so far is the the gear shift into workflow um and what i mean by that is and i don't know if this will be a challenge six months from now and it's probably a cha it's probably a default when you move into any new job but it, it is noticeable here is you know coming from what i'd say more is you know a a brand agency or a creative agency being a strategist there is there was someone driving the project. We had briefs. We had certain ways and cadence to how we did things and what you were responsible for. I would say in this role, maybe not in this role with this with this company, but just in in this kind of field itself, is you still have some of that, but it's it's much more fluid uh, because you may have to constantly kind of change or adapt. And that won't be probably on every project, but what I have noticed is, oh, if we, you know, there's a lot of, there is space to be able to say, we explored this, we learned this, and now we have to turn and go this way. We explored, we learned, and now we have to turn and go this way. We explored and learned, and that got us to the end. And I, I'm not saying that, I'm, I don't know if that's how it's going to work on everything, but then my initial exposure to that has been like, oh, there's a gear shift to be able to think about like how to stay on your toes a bit more, to be a bit more nimble around projects and like approaching it and like putting it together versus what I was coming from. It felt like maybe nimble and flat footed is a, is a good metaphor. It felt very much like, OK, this is this is how we're going to go and do this. We can do this. This we, we can go from here to here and it's done. And we know um, that might be, <clears throat> I don't know, that might be a weird kind of metaphor to put it together, but that's what it feels like. And I think that's been one of the challenges, but I don't see it as a bad challenge. I just see it as like, oh, this, this is a little bit different pace and cadence and way to kind of think about it that I've had to adapt to, but I think it's very adaptable. Mm -hmm. It sounds, it sounds like the, uh, predictability part so there's less in a sense less predictability in the challenges that you're working on right now uh there is a very high level approach a high level process but uh it's definitely less predictable what's going to happen on a day-by-day -day basis uh compared to some other design disciplines for instance right yeah i, I think and i, I don't know it'll be interesting it to is. see how it holds <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, it'll be interesting to see how it holds true because like I can only imagine like you starting to put like journeys and blueprints together and you start seeing like, oh, we need to we need to we need to go this way a little bit differently now. And that's what I'm expecting as part of it. So I don't know. I, uh, I'll, I'll email you uh, nine months from now and see if that holds true. <clears throat> what would you say are, and uh, this will also be interesting in, uh, uh, in a year time, but what are the big questions on your mind right now? <sighs> That's tough because I think I'm still kind of in uptake mode to be able to like figure out what the big questions are. Uh, I think what I'm starting to dance around is, uh, what, what are the things we, what are the things I will make versus what are the things that I will impact? Like, and where I, where that goes for me is there are, you know, there are, there are deliverables that we will create and, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to understand like what those, what those needed deliverables always are. Like there are, uh, there's always pixels on a screen. There's always pages, you know, that you do versus what is, what will be, what are the things we actually impact and how to really impact those um, said differently coming from my old world. I knew part of my impact was to impact the creative team to create an ad. Like that was part of my job. Like, that was part of what needed to happen. My, my output was actually a input into someone else and, or into a different team. Here, I'm trying to, it is like, does that still hold true or is the input and output the same person? Mm. You know, and I, it, it's not that I think I'm putting myself on a pedestal. It's like, oh, is what we do is how projects work is you know, all of this kind of works together. And I, we have, we have different teams of people. We have people who are specifically in research and specifically in other areas and visual design and things like that. So I don't think I am going to be taking that all on. It's not what I was getting at. It's more like, Oh, what is, where, where does that, what is the things I make and what is the, where does the impact, you know, where does that get directed to? That's a little bit of like a question I have now. And I don't, I don't know, it's a bigger question because I don't know where, what that answer is going to look like. So, um, I, I'm sure you, <laughs> I, I'm sure you, um, when you close your eyes and you visualize where you'll be in a year, um, uh, an, an image does appear like, and also yeah. with regards to this. So what do you see? What do you, what's the image of your work, your responsibilities, uh, in a year of time? What, what, yeah. Descri describe you yourself in a year time. <laughs> it's the I'll, I'll have the ability to jump into any any challenge and start understanding how to uh, work that challenge to create kind of really unique, really unique experiences and outcomes. And now, really unique is that like hugely unique or just unique for what it is. Those are all that will all be right sized as we go along. But I'm using that language to be able to say like, oh, what I'm what I'm hoping I look like is um, the ability to really get in there and, and like grab a hold of these like experience problems and create experiences on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I you know, I'm not going to go. I'm I'm not a developer. I'm not going to go build the code that's actually going to maybe make the thing, but. It'll be, I think I'll, I'll be much closer to the actual creation of the experience than I have been in the past. Mm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there'll be a, I think there'll be a stronger creative output than I'm, than I'm accustomed to. Um, and I don't, and I'm not saying I'm going to start wearing the, the, the title creative by any means, but I, I think there'll be a, a, a I'll be more comfortable being closer to that and helping drive and create that. Now, um, if we sort of start wrapping up our conversation, um, what, I'm, what would you say to somebody who's uh, in a similar situation like you, maybe six months uh, uh, earlier, like three months earlier, just, just before 
you were heading into this path. Is there a piece of advice that you would give? Uh, yes. And if, if you are really driven by that curiosity of how it all works, and when I say it all works, not just pure messaging or not just like pure marketing, but you you have a larger um, appetite or a larger appetite, curiosity appetite of like, I've always thought about like, how to drive this, the, the total experience, you know, both from business side to actually how stuff gets made and done and pushed out and connected, you know, you, you've thought larger, I would say you're probably three quarters of the way into this field already. And you just like, that is something I didn't know. And that's what I would say, pass on. If you are sitting on teams and you get frustrated because all you can impact is maybe a piece of marketing, but you think larger, this might be a place to explore and it's okay to explore it. You're probably more in it than you realize. And, you know, like you've heard people say on their show, oh, I run in service design. No, that's what I do. I think that's truer, but I think it's truer for probably more people than they know to experience this. And I would say, um, go have those discussions with, you know, the UX the people, CXers, the people wearing some of the experience design titles that you're around and see, see if you're like, oh, that's interesting. See where like, if, if the way you're experiencing kind of what they do also, you know, percolates like, oh, I, that's, that's, I find that kind of neat <laughs> said in a very weird way. Um, I think you're three quarters, like I said before, you're, you're more in it than you realize. Mm. And I think um, it's worthy to explore. I think you'll, you know, my advice to you would be go ahead, um, dig in a little bit more because the more I've dug into this, the more I've experienced it, even in though I've been very nervous and I've been, very, you know, scared is not the right word, but I, I have been uneasy because I felt like I didn't like belong in this group in a way. Um, the more I've gotten into it, the more I've realized like, yeah, the way I think or the way I like to think is a lot closer to this than, than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe uh, if we get the opportunity to talk again in, uh, in 12 months time, what would be the one question that I definitely should ask you. I would ask myself, um, the things that you were worried about, were they the right things to worry about? And what did you miss? What, what did you, you know, what, what was a misfire in your head? Like, what did you anticipate what is going to be this way, but actually went that way? Um, to provide further advice to somebody else of like, don't stumble on that same stumbling block. Like, <laughs> Like that wasn't as big as deal as you thought it was. This one was. And <clears throat> to understand that, I'd say like, you know, what were, what, yeah, <laughs> let me rephrase that. What were you worried about that you shouldn't have been worried about? Mm -hmm. And what should you have paid more attention to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's the noise and what's the real signal? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the sis there. That's great. Yeah. What's the noise? What's the real signal? Yeah. And, th and that's hard because, uh, yeah, most most of the time you just learn those things through experience. So we'll uh, let's see if we can make it happen uh, in a in a year time. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, sort of last of all, uh, thanks for reaching out. That's already a very big step and courageous step. Uh, not being uh, very experienced in this field and still being able to and willing to share your story. So I really appreciate that and. Uh, once again, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah, and thanks for, you know, like being game for even this. Um, but, you know, I I really appreciate, you know, all the podcasts that I've listened to. It's it's definitely given me, you know, helped me understand language and ways to kind of think about like what I was getting into. And, you know, and thank you for letting me stumble around here for an hour because it is, it is you know, real time for me trying to figure some of this out and just I, I find that valuable and happy to share it.
So th that, thank yeah, you for this yeah. opportunity. And then this is how the design process works, right? We stumble <laughs> forward, and uh, uh, that's just part of the game. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to provide a platform for that. So uh, thanks again, Herb. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation and most of all, got something useful out of it. If you did, make sure to click that subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks so much for watching to the Service Design Show and I'll see you in the next video.